this side of the room, I see you have like this really cool black and blue embroidered head thing on. Yeah. Head thing, that's a technical term. <laughs> um, I just wanted to know, the people that you know who are involved with ADR directing and adaptive writing and stuff who were not voice actors first, how did they get into it? Because I've already been through college, I'm getting my master's degree, I kind of have the degrees I have and that's it, so I just want to know like, if I have a chance. Um, okay, so your question is, you know, how basically how would you go about, you know, establishing yourself as an ADR director or a writer if you hadn't been in the booth, right? Is that my understanding correctly? Um, well, in, in the dubbing industry, it's enormously difficult because uh, the dubbing side of it and the fact that we're working under the constraints of pre-existing animation is means that in addition to everything you will have learned in school about production and writing, you're also having to sort of learn something that you could only learn by doing, which is working on a dub which is a very different animal. Um, when working on pre animation, for example, which is stuff they do here in the States, you know, the you have a bunch of actors in a room in front of mics and they're actually playing off each other. It's very similar to uh, a filmed scene for a, for a movie or a television show or um, a radio play or something like that. So there's this wonderful energy. It's like a, it's like a play uh, because all these actors are right there and they can look at each other and they're acting off each other. They stay on mic, of course, but they have each other's performances to feed off of in real time. In a dub, you don't have that luxury. We all record individually. Um, because of timing constraints. And by timing constraints, I mean we have pre-existing mouth movements, what we call flaps, uh, in the booth. It's, it's easier to say than mouth movements. So we say flaps, and because of that, it's almost impossible. You, you, the per, we're not actors, uh, we're not as free in that situation to be organic with each other. We have to be organic with what's on screen. And so it's actually easier to do it if you're not distracted by other actors in the booth with you. And as counterintuitive as that sounds, the truth is that's just how it works. And you have to, as an actor, be able to, to do that. As a director, because you're working with individuals in the booth, and you may be, oftentimes, um, in every case it happens, is you're, you're working with the actor who's the first person to lay down track on something. So Todd Habercorn may be coming in from me, and uh, I know, right, I say the name, and people are like, squeeb! Me too, I understand. Um, Todd Habercorn may come in, and he may have a scene, and there may be five other characters um, in this particular scene, but no one is recorded yet. So he has absolutely no one else's performance to play off of. He is recording in a vacuum. It's enormously disorienting for an actor unless the director is doing their job, which is to essentially be the rest of the cast for that actor. That doesn't mean that I come in on the mic and say, no, I'm gonna be this character, no, I'm gonna be this character, go! It's that you have to make sure that you explain to your actor in, in concisely as possible, because time is always of the essence in this business. Um, you have to explain to your actor and get them there very quickly about, you know, tell them what's going on, what's the emotional subtext of this scene, because all they're seeing is words on a page, and this is the first time they're seeing these words. We don't get the scripts before we go in, and the directors do, but the actors don't. They have to hit the ground running. Um, they come in and they read it, but there may be a thousand ways you could read this line. It may be like, what's up, or what's happening, or what's wrong. It may be very, very simple, aggregate of words, but unless you know where it's falling emotionally in the scene, what, what structural role it plays in the scene, um, you know, you, you, you have to find your own way. You can't do that if you don't know what's going on. Uh, so the director's job is to be like, okay, I know, it, I know like you're just saying what's up, but there's a subtext to this. So it's not like, what's up? It's gotta be more like a, needs to, you don't wanna give them line reads because that's death to an actor. Like, just say it like this. Um, but you would tell them, okay, there's, I need to hear a little reluctance in this line because you, ha you find yourself in a position where you have to talk to this person, but you don't really want to, but you have to say something. So that's gonna lead them into a very different read than, what's up? You know, they're gonna be like, what's up? And you go, oh, great, got it. So you have to do that, and that's very difficult to do. Um, as a director, because it's you have to keep so much in your head at one time, and time is always a constraint. So having said all that, um, basically trying to scare you away from wanting to work on dubs, um, most of the people that get into it that aren't experienced as actors in the booth, which is generally the, the, the prerequisite for working as a director or a writer because of that side of the process that you can, they don't teach classes on anywhere. You simply learn by doing it. But there are people that direct that, that didn't start there. Um, they usually start as audio engineers. And um, so I would tell you to study audio engineering, please. Because, and I say this, audio engineers have, they have so much of the responsibility for how a show turns out, especially when it comes to dubs because the way they have to work as well. It's very weird, it's very awkward, they don't have the freedoms that 
other recording engineers have because they have all these licensing constraints with what they, effects they can put on voices and things like that because there's all the Japanese who's like, ah, no, we don't like that, you can't use that, you can't do this. So they have to really, and they have to guide the performance. They have to, you know, in a way, they're, they're the director's co-pilot. An audio engineer is worth their weight in gold because they know how, they get very familiar with an actor's voice and with their particular take on this character and what they're going to do with their voice to say this line in that character's voice and they know, you know, how to tune everything and make sure that every little thing is picked up that that actor is trying. It's a difficult job, but that's why those are the people that typically um, become directors if they're not actors first, because they're, they might as well be actors for all the rapport they have with the people uh, in front of the mic. So having said that, the best path is to look for audio engineering internships. Um, you know, unless, because the writing and the, yeah, and, and the directing side, that, that's, there are no internships for that in this business. There aren't. Um, they are, uh, Terry Doty, my good friend, I do that anime show with her, and Steven. Um, she, she went to school for production, and she's wonderful at it. Um, and she directed for a while. We directed a few things together. She's marvelous. And she did, she did come up and sit and kind of do an internship for a little while. Um, and like learn from everybody. I'll see, you know, kind of uh, take notes of every director's individual style for a good long while before she got behind uh, set in the director's chair. But now that those opportunities are very, very rare um, because this business is kind of a closed circuit. I mean, it opens up every now and again, but you just have to go where the work is and you have to be willing to do it for free for a little while, which is what we call an internship. Um, and, and just learn by watching people and, and you know, it's, it's, it's like anything, it's a creative job, so you may come into it with your own ideas, like, I want to do this, and I want to do this, I've got, I've got a vision, and the minute the reality hits you, you're like, oh, well, okay, I've got deadlines, and I've got people breathing down my neck to do it this way because they don't see where I'm coming from, blah, 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 blah. So you have to learn to work very well with other people who are also creative, and creative people can be a little difficult to work with. Because we fight, we fight for our vision. We're like, I want to do it this way. Well, I want to do it this way. <laughs> you know. So I hope that helps. It's difficult, but but I would tell, I would steer you in the direction of audio engineering. Take workshops, take classes, take look for audio engineering inter uh, internships. Familiarize yourselves with all the programs like you know Pro Tools and stuff like that, because those are those are the nuts and bolts of what we do. And without those in place, and without really 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 talented people um, sitting in that chair, um, everyone else is completely you know, uh, obsolete. So, good question, and good luck to you, good luck to you.